All right, if you've been following along on my channel, you know that I love the Canon R5C. I've fallen more in love with this camera over the last two and a half years that I've been using it. I picked up a second one recently and just made a video about that while I still think it's so relevant today. And part of the reason is that it has 8K RAW. Now, 8K RAW is still not even offered in the new Canon C80. It's not even offered in the Canon C400. So 8K RAW coming out of the Canon R5C is a big deal, but it can be unwieldy to deal with in editing. And I've had a lot of people ask me what I do whenever I'm editing this footage. Like, how do I handle it? I thought I was getting pretty decent performance, passable performance on my current computer, but then I figured out one other element that was actually a bottleneck. We're gonna go into that. And I'm also gonna offer some additional tips to pay attention to whenever you are editing to make sure that you're maximizing the performance that you can get. So let's get started. In a world where nuclear war has begun, vampires fought back in super real 3D. Now, SSDs, that is really what you need to be editing on. If you're editing raw, you, in general, you wanna be editing on SSDs. The only thing that I use spinning disks for, traditional hard disk, drive disks, is for data backup. I build that into the cost for my client's project. I buy two drives. I back all their data up onto that, but that's not what I'm editing off of. Now that's just the way I do it. Other people might do it differently, but I let those drives live with that data on them. I separate them into different buildings should anything ever happen. And this way into the future, when the client usually wants to update projects and so on, I can just reference that data, get it back on SSDs. Now the kind of SSDs that I use inside of my computer are Samsung QVO SSDs. They're eight terabytes each. So I have four of those and they work pretty good when they're internal to the computer. You're gonna get better performance than just running them USB style, which you can do. You can get this, and I do do this, I do do this. So you can get a SATA. <laughs> now you could have an enclosure, but these, this is a cheap way to do it if you're just trying to build up data. I, I have never actually had a data corruption issue doing this, and it's, I know it's frowned upon, but look, this is an, a SATA to USB-C. You could get a you know, USB-A if that's what you're doing. And this works, this will get you by. I, I actually can edit and grade this way. But performance-wise, for an increase, a, real, a significant increase in performance, especially when it comes to layers of the 8K RAW, and like this is, you know, your project gets deep, what you really wanna be using is NVMe SSDs, M.2 SSDs, and you've probably heard of those. You might even be running one as your main drive, your C drive on your computer, but you know, you don't have enough data on there to be doing entire projects. You also don't necessarily wanna be doing every aspect of your project onto a single drive. You wanna spread that out, and that's part of the performance thing we're gonna discuss in a second. But one solution is to get a Thunderbolt. If you have Thunderbolt ports on your computer, which is, if you can get a Thunderbolt card for your computer, if you don't have those, it's going to be worth it. It's a dramatic difference in experience. It's a, way less of a bottleneck. And you can put an NVMe SSD inside of an enclosure. You can build your own or you can buy them. But this is cheaper. This is cheaper. So primarily what I have been buying, the WD Black 4 terabyte SN850X NVMe's. And then I will put those into enclosures. Now there's a Samsung version of this. It's also four terabytes. I wanna say it's the 980. I'll find out and put it in this video. And I do think that that one actually might get slightly better benchmarks. This WD one just happens to go on sale at the times that I purchased them. I think both of those NVMe SSDs go on sale pretty often. I mean, every time I look, they seem to be on sale. In fact, I've like gone and bought another one because I have three of these. When I've gone to look for them, I, there has been a time where they were at full price and I just waited. And then a month later, it was on sale again for like the same price that I was amazing. And we're talking about the difference of like a couple of hundred dollars cheaper. I wanna say all in all for each of these that I've purchased, the enclosure that's Thunderbolt capable, not USB, that's a big difference, plus the NVMe SSDs. They came in at like 310 bucks each, something like that. So four terabytes a pop. And this covers me for one of my films. So when I make um, sometimes 20, up to 25 minute long documentaries for Trans Am Worldwide, or at this point now clients at Trans Am Worldwide. There's a really big project. That is 
so awesome. And I've been filming in a lot of 8K RAW. If I'm doing takes or if I'm doing significant product, like actual lit product shots, not just being there in a live setting and just filming all day, I'm gonna be filming in RAW. So anytime that I can control the situation, do takes, or I want the absolute best image quality, I'm going to RAW every time. I'm only going to the XFABC if I'm filming something happen, kind of like in a live setting, like they're installing an engine or they're painting. This is gonna go on for hours over the course of the day, and that is too much data. And I might pop it on at key moments, like once I see the car change color, like during that pass, that first coat of paint, I'm gonna go to RAW. These are just additional tips, but nonetheless, that's, that's filming. So the performance difference that I experienced when editing with those was pretty dramatic. And in particular, I do music videos. And even if you are using the proxies, when I'm editing music videos, I have multicam sequences and I am using proxies, but sometimes I'm stacking those like eight deep. And this is again where, you know, if I'm doing layers of eight deep and then I'll do another pass of a different amount of takes that are eight layers deep. And then at the end of it, I'm like stitching together multiple passes, sometimes 30 layers worth of content that's all in proxy mode, but this is data intensive. And these NVMe SSDs really made a significant difference in the last three music videos that I made where I got to use them. In my opinion, it's a game changer to try and get into NVMEs and they've come down in price enough that I think it's very feasible for you to do it. And for, for most of your guys' projects, I mean, they're not gonna be bigger than four terabytes, I would think. Now for me, I'm taking on these longer films, so I'm getting into eight and 12 terabytes per large project. You know, but that's not the case for a lot of other work that I do. A lot of work that I do is just like a terabyte for the day, sometimes 700 gigs, which is nothing. I'll have like, you know, <laughs> that I've gotten used to that being nothing. So Thunderbolt ports, NVM SSDs, put into enclosures. This is how you can continue to expand how much data you might need for projects. Sometimes, you know, obviously what I'm doing is, is I'm plugging in a couple of these at a time. If it expands past eight terabytes, because I've only got two Thunderbolt ports, I will run additional footage days off of these um, eight, <laughs> eight, seven, oh, <laughs> jeez, wheeze, 870 QVO SSDs. Um, you know, it can spill onto those and I've got the most demanding stuff on these uh, NVMEs. What you can also do is you can render a place as you go and you can consolidate the project as you go. Now, does this sound overwhelming to you? Well, maybe it does, um, but I would say that absolutely regardless, the best bang for the buck in performance, regardless of what you're editing, is going to be these NVMe SSDs. This is the direction that you'd want to go if you can afford to do it. Once I'm done with the project, they're off those fast editing drives and they're backed up on two external drives that I built into the cost of my customer's invoice. They're cool with this because they get the footage lives with me uh, potentially forever, you know, and I will have clients come back years later. I need to do stuff and then we want to access that footage. I can just get it back onto whatever active SSDs I'm using at the time that I freed up for that particular project. So always keep the door open with your projects that you can continue them on into the future and do more with them later. You might be surprised at some clients that come back with you uh, and want to do something and you thought that it was over and you don't have that anymore to work with. And so anyway, now this is going to be the case for most any NLE that you're using, any nonlinear editing software that you're using. The less windows that you have open, the better. One dramatic thing is just having on your scopes and you're not even really doing color grading then, you just kind of have it up and it's buried in a window behind it. That's going to affect your performance. If you have two layers a video stacked on top of each other, even though it's only playing the top layer, just because that bottom layer is under there, it really makes a difference with performance. You can turn the eye off on that layer. Uh, you can disable it or enable the layer by right clicking on it and choosing disable or enable. I have a shortcut command set up for that for me. I'm big on shortcuts. So I can just, boom, you know, disable, boom, turn it back on, you know, and that way that won't have to affect performance, but I didn't delete the layer under there in case I need to go back to it or, you know, use a different shot from under there, especially if it's been filmed with two cameras, they're lined up, they're synced, and you you realize later that you do want the second shot. You don't want to be deleting that stuff out of the, the project, but you also do want the best performance playback that you can get in real time. Another thing is inside of the wrench icon of the video preview window, there's a checkbox 
and I made a video about this, that for a lot of people, it was turned on for me when I updated to the last version of Premiere by default, that's high quality playback. You want to actually uncheck that. That is separate from the resolution size that you're playing it back at. So you can choose the resolution size. You don't want to be playing it full. For me, I mainly edit in half or sometimes a quarter if i am got layers and layers happening or if I put graphic text on top, you know, in the edit and stuff, I might go to a quarter resolution, which is still totally reasonable to be editing with. This is once I've gone to an 8K instead of the proxies. Unchecking that high quality playback in the video window, that can make a massive difference. I made an entire video just about discovering that one thing that was slowing down and making my video chug for playback and I was just dropping frames left and right. Left and right. So definitely make sure that's unchecked. Put your footage into a 4K timeline. I mean, I don't know if you're actually aiming to deliver an 8K. If you are, I mean, I don't know who's asking for that. I haven't had a client ask for 8K. The 8K being put into a 4K timeline is a dramatic difference in performance versus just creating a sequence from your 8K footage and that's 8K or creating an 8K sequence and then trying to edit that. That is a completely different animal of performance and I can't do it. You know, even with all the specs that I have on my computer, it doesn't, it won't do that. Um, but I don't need to do that. I, I want to deliver in 4K. I'm editing 8K in a 4K timeline. I want the cropping ability. I want the downsampling ability, the benefit that happens from putting an 8K video into a 4K timeline and then downsampling it. That's going to produce a better image in itself. And it also, as I've mentioned in a couple of other videos, does increase your dynamic range. On the Canon R5C, you can get up to around 13.6 stops of dynamic range if you are filming in 8K RAW and you put that into a 4K timeline and also make sure that you're editing it in C-Log2. If all those checkboxes are done, you're achieving potentially 13.6 stops of dynamic range, which is pretty good. And I think that the highlight roll-off and seeing comparisons to it versus the Sony FX3, the highlight roll-off is actually, I think, a little bit better. All right, the last thing that I can think of to mention, just your general workflow, you do not want to be putting effects onto this footage until the very, very end. Putting on a LUT is pretty darn gentle. It shouldn't mess things up, but once you start manipulating stuff past that to get that LUT to look good, every slider position that you change is gonna start adding up as something that it has to calculate. So you don't wanna be putting your effects on till the end. Now, what you can do is you can totally toy around with putting effects on your footage. I like to do that as I go in a project, just kind of like dropping little things on, testing, checking on it each day, but I don't wanna bog down my project. So what you do have access to that's not necessarily in Adobe's video window player by default, um, at least unless I've done it in the newest version, but I don't think that they have. There's a, but you can assign a global effects button in there. Just go in to add buttons underneath your video window and you will see a little picture, a little square that says FX, those two letters. And that's your global effects button. You can drag that down and put it into your general set of buttons right there underneath the video window. And you can literally toggle that on and off and it turns on and off all your effects. So you can build out a total color grade plan have it stacked layers deep because I do many instances of Lumetri and I also use Red Giant Suite. And you can have all that stuff on, figure out your look, keep checking on it daily, see if something catches your eye that you don't like or make tweaks and stuff, and then just hit that button underneath your video window and you've turned off all the effects on there. There's a good chance you already know that, but a lot of people don't know that. I've talked to a lot of people that don't know that. So, that, I mean, that's massive being able to do that. There's a proxy button as well that you can assign underneath the video window. You can toggle on and off whether it's the proxy or it's the legitimate, you know, 8K raw file. All those things combined, the drives, keeping video windows consolidated that you have open at the time that you're editing, being mindful of how many layers you have on your timeline and disabling ones, or at least turning off the eyeball on layers that are underneath things that you're just trying to keep them there in case you want to reference them later in the edit when you go to make final tweaks. And the checkbox, that's the high quality playback, de-clicking that if it's on by default with you. And then your playback resolution box, click on that, put that at half or a quarter. You're doing all this. So at the end, when you go to color grade your final video and you're working with that beautiful 8K raw 12 bit color, you get the absolute best image that you can possibly deliver to your client. And the bottom line is the better your stuff looks, the more you can charge next time. The more you separate yourself from the herd, the more the larger projects you can bid on because your portfolio has got to be the best that you can deliver. 
I just don't understand the idea. If you're saying that your clients don't pay you enough to film at that, your goal should be that you want to present prices that justify using your tools to the maximum ability that you can because if you can do that a handful of times, not only will you make more money for less work as far as volume goes, you can put more time and effort into making the best singular piece that you can, which actually makes your portfolio look better. Your portfolio doesn't look better because you've done a wide variety of things with an average picture look. Your portfolio enables you to charge more if it just, even if you only have two things that look undeniably full-fledged pro. And the, you, if you have a camera that can deliver a dramatically better image ultimately, then I really say keep exploring how to get the maximum picture that you can out of the camera. How can you criticize that you're not getting a good enough image out of your camera if you're not even using what it's capable of producing? <laughs> I just don't, you know. Now, that being said, I should point out a dramatic thing. Oh, my gosh, I should have said this at the beginning. In fact, I might edit this and put it at the beginning. <laughs> Look, 8K RAW LT. That's all I use. I don't use, <laughs> so I know I'm sounding like I'm eating my own words, but the LT is so good. And I'll tell you, the ST, I can't edit it. It It is too demanding on my system, even with those specs. Now, one day, maybe I'll switch to that. But I will say this. The data load difference between the higher end of the raw that the camera offers versus the lower end with the LT and the diminished returns that you get out of the flexibility in that picture is just Honestly, it's not worth it to me. It's way more data. And I just didn't feel, when I tested it, I I did use it for like a color grade test. It's different to do that versus an entire 20 minute film. And I just wasn't, I could not get a difference to come out of it. And I'm pretty seasoned. I've been doing this for 22 years now. So, um, and I've worked with a lot of different cameras from Sony to RED to, to Canon. So it's not like, I don't know what I'm doing here. And I'm just telling you, it's like really such diminished returns. I feel like the LT is just phenomenal. It's the right file size. It's not as flexible or easy to work with editing friendly wise as the red, but it's very, very good. And it, the image quality rivals the red um, very, very much so. Very much so. I could do a different video about where things fall off and which one does better and what. That's a whole other thing. So anyway, I did mention before that you don't necessarily want to have everything that you're doing for a project on one drive. And I didn't go back to that. Let me close the video out with mentioning what that what I mean by that is, is that in general, what you want to have is your operating system is running off of your C drive. And then you have your footage on potentially one of these. And then if you have another one, great. But if you don't, then I would, you know, maybe an SSD or normal SSD, you know, something like this. These are very reasonably priced, eight terabytes, you know, four terabytes versus eight terabytes. It's almost double the price for these. So this might be a solution for you. And you want to be rendering, exporting on to another drive. So you're actually, in, when you're, if you're trying to get maximum performance, you want it spread between three different drives. At least that's been my experience. That's what I was taught and it still holds true when I test it. Um, if there's been other developments that people know about, feel free to chime in and drop it down here on the, on the, uh, chat feed here I, I, on the comments. I would love for there to be a conversation about this because this is like something we can all figure out together. If you guys have other tips that you want to recommend, go ahead and throw them down there. I, I'm not trying to, I want this to be a conversation. So we're all building a community about how best to utilize the best performance that we can get out of working with our fantastic Canon R5Cs. Okay. I hope all that helps you. I hope maybe you found it uh, useful enough that you would hit a like. I don't know. Um, <laughs> not shooting for the stars here. If you want to subscribe, that's fantastic. Um, I do make a lot of videos about the Canon R5C, but also just about video production in general. Um, I do stuff with filming and the actual editing. I'm going to get have some cool ones coming up soon with color grading. So, all right, take care, guys. Peace.